Namaskar and uh, welcome to Namaste 2020. Uh, this is brought to you by the Center for Soft Power uh, with support from the ICCR and also Svyasa University. This session is on word power. When we say word power, what brings to my mind is the Maheshwara Sutra, which were the first 14 syllables that came out of the Damaru of Lord Shiva. And that expresses the power of word of syllables. And to us in the Indian ethos, every word and every syllable is also divine. So as writers, as authors, as speakers, every word we say enshrines divinity. And with these two words, I would like to invite and I welcome everybody, swagatam to all of you. And we just saw these beautiful little children from a land that is no connection to India, far away, but very connected to India because of the language that they use, which is Sanskritam. I would like to invite the chair, Sri Ashwin Sanghi. He is an author, and he ranks amongst India's highest selling English fiction authors. He has written several bestsellers, The Rosabal Line, Chanakya's Chant, The Krishna Key, The Sialkot Saga, Keepers of the Kala Chakra, and The Vault of Vishnu in the Bharat series and two New York Times best-selling crime thrillers with James Patterson, Private India, and Private Delhi. Ashwin Sange also mentors, co-writes, and edits titles in the immensely popular 13-step series on subjects as diverse as luck, wealth, marks, health, and parenting. Over to you, Sri Ashwin Sange, and thank you so much for accepting our invitation. This is a thank you to all the uh, wonderful people who are here. Uh, we are sorry that we couldn't bring Dr. David Schulman to you today because he is uh, not well. So uh, we all wish him a very speedy recovery. And over to you, Sri Ashwin. You can take forward the chair uh, in the manner that you have decided. Thank you. Thank you, Vijay Lakshmi ji. Thank you so much for that very, very kind introduction. And uh, on my screen right now, I can see some of my panelists, uh, Mr. Andy Frankel, uh, Vasudev Murthy, and of course, uh, uh, Dr. Ruchinsky, but I can't seem to see Acharya Vidya Bhaskar. Uh, so I just wanted to recheck whether he's on or. Uh, uh, I'll just try calling him, Ashwin. I'll just call him. Okay. So would would you like us to start without him, or how would you how would you suggest Vijay Lakshmi ji? I, I think you can start, and he can join us because Wonderful. we have a session after this also. So okay. time is. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. So we will get started. Uh, maybe I can just start with the quick introductions. Uh, and um, of course, uh, Dr. Ruchinsky is mostly known to people as Yoganand Shastri. So I hope uh, uh, Yoganand Shastri ji, you won't have any problems in my referring to you by that name. Uh, because we seem to have uh, had a lot of difficulties with uh, the spelling of the former name. Uh, in our email interactions. So, uh, yeah. Uh, Yoganand Shastri, yes. I like absolutely. That. And uh, of course, uh, Yoganand Shastri ji is the vice president of the uh, Vivashwan um, Foundation of Poland. And he has uh, studied um, the Acharya Yogatantra from the uh, Sanskrit University of uh, Varanasi. And uh, we also have with us uh, Mr. Andy Frankel who is an award-winning author and a sacred storyteller, a recipient of the West Virginia Artist Fellowship Award, uh, and amongst several. In fact, that list is ex exceptionally long. Uh, he is on the roster of the West Virginia Division of Culture and History and has offered workshops and performances in a wide variety of venues and events, uh, including the Parliament of World Religions. Um, and uh, let me also go to uh, Vasudev Murthy, uh, who is a man of varied talents, a violinist, a yoga enthusiast, animal welfare activist, uh, a visiting professor of management, uh, I think at uh, Vasudev, if I'm right or wrong, IIM MB. Uh, yes, correct. Bangalore. Yes. And the author of seven books on topics ranging from management to crime to humor, classical music uh, has been published by several publishers. Work has been translated into several languages. Uh, and of course, I don't think we still have uh, Acharya Vidya Bhaskar with us. 
uh, but maybe I can just offer a couple of lines of introduction. Uh, at the age of 14, received initiation and empowerment in the Kanchipuram-based Sri Vidya lineage. Uh, today, of course, he treated, uh, teaches traditional Sanskrit grammar as well as meditation-related scriptures and compassion-related practices in Switzerland, Austria, and the United Kingdom. Uh, so thank you so much to all the panelists for being here uh, today. And I'm delighted uh, to be doing the honors. Uh, I'm going to try and speak far less, and I'm going to let you uh, get your words in, because this is all about the power of words. So uh, let me start uh, with a question, actually, for uh, uh, Vasudev Murthy. Uh, Vasudev, you, you are, of course, a visiting professor of management uh, at the Indian Institute of Management, Bangalore. And the books you have written, of course, are diverse, ranging from management to crime to humor. And uh, you've also been a facilitator and a leadership trainer, worked with large global corporations. So why don't I let you set the ball rolling in terms of how important are words and language in the world of management, business, or for that matter, anything else? How important are words? Uh, thank you, Ashwin. Can you hear me? Just confirming. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Uh, first of all, thank you very much. It's a, it's a fantastic honor and a privilege to uh, be speaking with all of you. Um, uh, and to your question, let me uh, let me say that, of course, uh, it goes without saying, words are very powerful. Words make a difference. Words change lives. All that is absolutely true. But uh, I would like to answer your question a little later in the sense of what you know, it has to do with management and so on. We're talking about word power. I think you'll agree with me, Ashwin, uh, looking at the nature of even your own books. There has been a resurgence in uh, a kind of a pride. And I, I don't think it's a, it's a, it's a modest pride. Uh, it's, 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 it's real about our culture, our past, and so on. And so, so we have plenty of things that we are drawing upon now as modern uh, Indian writers to write about. We have plenty of topics, which I think a lot, a lot more, a lot of, lots of other countries actually do not have. Now, management, of course, is one thing. That's my bread and butter. Um, and so therefore, I write about that. Uh, but that itself is a quick lead to the fact that today, a lot of business schools, a lot of management principles do talk about things which are, you know, like, like Kautelya's Arthashastra and so on and so forth. And there must be something which is probably good about our, our system, our way of thinking, our, our ethos, which has led to so many of us, uh, I won't include myself necessarily, but many global leaders of organizations somehow reaching the top ranks uh, and they happen to be of Indian heritage. So I don't think that's an idle boast, but it just seems to be factual. So maybe there's something there, there's something in which it affects our way of thinking, the way we look at life, uh, a vision, and so on and so forth. So that is just, of course, as far as management is concerned. But to take, uh, take things forward, I think uh, we, are, we are very fortunate, I'm talking about Indian writers now, that uh, we have, number one, so much to draw upon, and I'll, I'll give a list in a, in a moment, right? Of course, the fact is English being some, something of a de facto, you know, the way in which we communicate the vast majority of cases, this gives us a fantastic access to, to the world, which perhaps people uh, from other countries are not able to do, right? Second, there's fundamental liberalism in the way we, uh, we think in India. I think you'll agree. We are very open to any kinds of thoughts, be able to assimilate and think and, and take opposing positions. We have a vibrant, noisy democracy, and that feeds into the mind. So the kinds of books we all churn out are, are, are just widely across, across the spectrum, right? And as I said, there's a resurgence in pride in our heritage. I mean, I don't want to sound political, but frankly, it is a fact that in the past several years, we have really found it very, very something to be proud of to talk about our mythology, uh, you know, our, our cultural backgrounds, and so on and so forth. And for example, uh, you know, you're probably aware that many cultural artifacts these days, which have been stolen from the past, we probably didn't care much about it. Okay, people are taking it and putting it in the British Museum, who cares? But now there's an active movement of bringing back these idols. We care about our past. Okay, and I'm bringing this up because all these are leading into things that we can write about and you and I can write about. Okay, again, uh, uh, you know, yoga. I mean, that is something which in terms of soft power, which is the agenda for today. So yoga is something which is kind of a global, it's now a part of our English diction, uh, the dictionary, and uh, it's all over the world. Everyone's trying to do yoga, and we've had, uh, you know, uh, arguments about this something called forest yoga, this something called, uh, called goat yoga, all kinds of, so that again is, <laughs> is, is an indication of some kind of influence we seem to be having, it's a very powerful, positive influence. Let's talk about music, okay? 
classical music, for example, uh, I, you just, I just saw the end of the last uh, section on, on, on textiles or whatever it was, and you saw that someone had composed uh, something about, you know, based on our, our music. And our music is so complex, it's so beautiful. I think a lot of people get it. You find a lot of individuals coming to India, learning about it. Again, I write about classical music, and I'm sure many other people do. And therefore, in that sense, there is an advantage. We already have rich material available. We don't have to go too far away to create, uh, you know, uh, stories and things for to read. And in English, if required. Let's move on to animal welfare. Okay. And, and stop me if I'm taking too much time because I may be rambling a little bit. So, so go ahead and tell me. No, no talk what I would like to do is, what I would like to do is, I would like, like to get you to elaborate far more on okay. the music part of it, but sure. I want to come back to you so that I can get in the opening words from the other panelists, Vasudev. Sure, sure. Is sure. that all right with you? Sure. Shall uh, I speak about music a little bit now or later? Or later? No, no. I, I'm going to come back to you. I'm, I'm, okay. I'm going to do a merry-go-round in terms sure, of... Sure, sure, in terms sure. of uh, uh, please please, please take it forward. Please yeah? take it forward. Yeah. So uh, uh, let me uh, go to uh, Yoganand Shastri. Uh, or uh, Yoganand ji, uh, 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 and Namaskar. Uh, but मैं मैं आपकी कहानी जो है आपकी कहानी बहुत ही विचित्र कहानी है आपकी जन्मभूमि पोलैंड है पर आपकी कर्मभूमि भारत है तो हम हमें इस यात्रा के बारे में कुछ बताइए योगनंद शास्त्री जी कि वो एक अगर आपको याद होगा एक पुरानी पिक्चर थी बॉम्बे टू गोवा तो अगर आपकी कहानी को की पिक्चर बनानी होती तो हम हम शायद उसको कहते हैं वॉर्सो टू वाराणसी तो कर सकते हैं हाँ तो ये परिवर्तन कैसे हुआ हमको जरा समझाइए ऐसे हुआ कि मेरा जन्म ऐसे परिवार में हुआ जहाँ संस्कृत और भारतीय संस्कृति के प्रति बहुत श्रद्धा थी मेरे पिता जी भी संस्कृत के जानकार हैं माता जी भी अनेक ग्रंथों का अनुवाद किया है संस्कृत से तो हम लोग तीन भाई एक बहन हैं तो हमारे यहाँ बचपन में संस्कृत के प्रति बहुत श्रद्धा थी और आगे ये स्वाभाविक था कि हम लोग आगे भारत आएंगे आगे इस ज्ञान को प्राप्त करने के लिए तो इसी प्रकार से यात्रा हुई जब मैं पंद्रह सोलह साल का था तब मैं भारत आ गया और भारत इतना अच्छा लगा कि मैं यहीं बस गया तो पर, पर आप, आप पैदाइशी पोलैंड के हैं पूरा पोलैंड ये नहीं है कि आपके पेरेंट्स जो थे आपके माता पिता यहाँ पर भारत आ चुके थे और फिर आप आप पैदा हुए तो मतलब आप टीनेजर थे जब तक आप यहाँ पर पहुंचे नहीं नहीं मेरे माता जी पिता जी पहले दो एक बार आए भारत देखने के लिए माता जी इंडोलॉजी पढ़ी पिता जी भारत के दर्शन से पीछे किए तो एक हमारे परिवार का संबंध रहा था रिश्तेदार लोग आते जाते थे इंडिया परिचित लोग आते जाते थे लगातार संपर्क हुआ करता था भारत के साथ और मैं अकेला नहीं आया मेरे माता जी और बड़े भैया के साथ आया मैं पंद्रह सोलह साल का था तब मैं भारत मैं पहला कदम रखा और और भारत भारत मतलब जब मैं कहता हूँ कि ये आपकी कर्म भूमि है तो क्या मैं कुछ गलत कह रहा हूँ कि आ, ये ये जो ये जो जमीन है इससे आपको किसी प्रकार का प्रेम हो गया जी 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 बिल्कुल सही है कर्म भूमि यही मैं बस गया यही काम कर रहा हूँ यही मेरा जीवन बीत रहा है बहुत बहुत खूब योगानंद जी आ, मैं मैं अब आई विल कम टू एंडी फ्रेंकल एंडी थैंक यू फॉर वेटिंग पेशेंटली फॉर मी टू कम अराउंड टू यू एंड अ प्लेजर टू मीट यू आई वुड रिक्वेस्ट यू टू प्लीज अनम्यूट योर सेल्फ बिकॉज आई कैन सी दैट करंटली यू आर म्यूटेड आई थिंक yeah wonderful wonderful uh so yes uh, uh, uh you know you are an award winning author uh and uh, of course but some may not be aware of the fact that you are a practitioner and teacher of the hari krishna siddhanta for almost about 50 odd years mm -hmm. and i'm given to understand from what i've read up that you were born in germany arrived in the us at age 5 and when you were put into a new york public school you had a problem with communicating and yet when i look at this your journey took you into the world of communication so would you give us a little bit of a background in terms of how that happened how did you go into something which you were so which you had a problem with well you know when i uh, I, i was born in germany my mother was a german lutheran okay. and my father was a polish jew okay. and so his friends said oh this will never work out and her friend said oh 
this will never work out. Never work out. But the two of them, they made it work out. My father came to America first. He worked for several years and raised enough money to bring my mother and I. I came to America at the age of five. And so I was born in a little village in Germany, not more than 50 houses. And now I was thrust into the middle of New York City and I went to the public school and it was very uh, much of a shock. And so I couldn't express myself. I couldn't communicate. And so uh, I didn't realize it, but for years later, I began to understand why uh, expression and communication mm -hmm. was so important to me because of that experience that I had when I was a child. And so uh, my mother, in growing up in New York City, she continued to speak German to me. And then I responded in English. <laughs> wow. And so we continued like this. And so I tried uh, various forms of expression. When I was a, uh, an adolescent, I was writing poetry. Then later on, I decided to do some uh, art. And I, I bought $100 worth of art supplies. This is back in the mid 60s or early 60s. At that time, $100 was, went uh, quite a ways. But I can imagine. You know, it was only for me, it was, I wanted to do it, but in one sense, it wasn't me. I bought the art supplies. And the interesting thing is that after my father retired in the, apo in, in the apartment, I had already moved out, but he found the art supplies that I had purchased and he began to paint. In the last 10 years of his life, he must have painted about 200 paintings. And so this uh, urge for um, expression and communication takes many forms. Mm -hmm. we, all, we all want to communicate. We all want to be expressive. And in the, many of the workshops that I've done over the years, one of them is called In Search of Story. Uh, I'm surprised to find that many people don't consider themselves creative. They say, oh, this person is creative, or you are creative, but mm -hmm. they never acknowledge that they're creative. Mm -hmm. But actually, uh, we all have this creative tendency. We want to be creative. And, Basically, you don't need to be a singer or a dancer or a writer to be creative. We can create in so many different ways. People create a, a, a business. People create a garden. They're creating a family. So mm -hmm. it, it, we have to tap into our creativity in a lot of different ways. And one of those ways is word power. And by the time I got to uh, college, I wanted to grab the bull by the horn, so to speak. And I got involved in theater. So, uh, you know, I wanted to really uh, push the limits because I was still, in, even in, by the time I got to college, I was still very shy. And I was still very unsure about how to express myself properly. Right. And so I got involved in theater at that time. Right. And and that that journey once you once you developed your confidence, then I, I guess that there was no real turning back because then you realized what the power uh, of those words were. Yes, the the the, the words have uh, such extraordinary power. Actually, you know, the, in I got I spent um, many years doing dramas. And I moved to uh, my community here in West Virginia, New Brindavan, mm -hmm. back in the uh, late 70s. Mm -hmm. And I developed a theater program here. Wonderful. And so, uh, and we took those plays to different colleges, different places. Lovely. And, <clears throat> Lovely. That, that, that's, that's incredible. Uh, if I can come back to Vasudev, uh, where, where I cut you off, which oh, was... And the reason for cutting you off there was because of the fact that I know that you're a violin player. Oh, okay. So there are, mul multiple, there are multiple forms of communication. And I was just wondering, I mean, you know, uh, uh, I, I was looking at, uh, 
I was uh, looking at your biography and I, I was thinking about this, that ultimately at the end of the day, uh, uh, you know, that uh, communication can be in so many different forms. The, I mean, written text, spoken language, even something like eye contact or a facial expression, uh, gestures, musical melodies, uh, 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 unspoken thoughts. Uh, you know, in some ways, at, at times, I find that for me at least, uh, communication through music uh, sometimes is even more powerful than the than the written word. So could you, uh, pr probably as a person who is uh, dealing with both words as well as music, could you possibly enlighten us in terms of, you know, which you consider to be the more powerful or do you think that we don't need to have that comparison? Well, um, in a way you answer the question, but okay, of course, Music is something uh, very personal, but as far as the context today is concerned, the feelings that come across are extraordinary. And I think with regard to uh, our, our soft power, back to our, our original point, the classical music of India has had such, such extraordinary depth, both in its analysis, the taxonomy, and the wide variety of, you know, we have Navrasas and all that. So there's so many different kinds of emotions that are our musicologists, our predecessors have thought through. Even the naming of the rags is not an accident. So when you, you know, that's interesting. So here's sound, there's melody and the actual name. So for example, if you look at Bhairav, right? Bhairav implies Shiva. Now when you play the rag Bhairav, and if you play it right, I mean, you can do nothing else but imagine that, you know, you are uh, perhaps worshiping him or, you know, ideally the personification of, of, uh, of, of Shiva should come forward. So like that, even the naming of the, of the rags for our weak understanding of the meanings behind these things is, is, is fantastic. Again, the taxonomy, the analysis. But I think in a way you're right because the, the, kinds, of, the kinds of things our music communicates sometimes transcends words. Perhaps we don't have words for them, right? And sometimes you listen to a particular melody, some rag, let's say Nikhil Banerjee or Vilayat Khan, whoever it is. And uh, there will be unspoken things happening to you within, you may, you may have tears, you don't know why you're crying, you may have the hair on your skin coming up, you know, you, you, as they say, right? Strange things happen to you and you don't know why, but it's happening. Something is communicating with other, with other uh, parts of your, of, your, of, your, of your very being. Uh, and like I said, uh, our, our classical music, uh, and I've written about it, I think because I was actually inspired about it. Of course, I'm not trying to push my book here, but the point was, uh, it, it is so inspiring. Our music can actually make you start writing. And uh, there is, in fact, a very be beautiful thing. We have a Polish gentleman of at least Polish heritage here. And I can't remember, I think it was Paga, Paga Nini who wrote about something called uh, the De Devil's Trill. So in that, uh, the devil is supposed to have appeared with a violin. Okay, as a violin, you can probably see on my, my left. Violin being the devil's instrument, by the way, Ashwin. Uh -huh. and oh, wow, he, I didn't know that. Yes, is now that, you know. Is that a fact? Is that, is, <laughs> well, is, so they say, that's the lore, okay. So if, <laughs> if I play that, the devil will show up sooner or later. And in particular, there's the, the fifth, the, there's something called the Tivra Madhya, which is called the, the fifth note, uh, which is supposed to have even more, uh, you know, uneasy vibrations, so to say. And in that particular story, we have that this guy was asleep and uh, the devil appeared with a violin at the end of a bed. And he, he played this unbelievably, uh, you know, dramatic music, which was out of the world. This guy woke up in a sweat and he just tried his best to catch it and he failed miserably, but still wrote a piece of haunting, unbelievable music that if you listen to today, you'll still feel weird. So perhaps to answer your question, words are perhaps a weak method of, uh, of communicating and music is perhaps even more powerful. Our great advantage, at least I can speak of Indian music, is that people have thought through this, the wide variety of rags that they have thought through, whether it's seasonal, whether it's the time of the day, whether it's supposed to in, you know, in, in, induce uh, the feeling of mamta or of bravery or else of, of romance. Everything has been thought through in great depth. So for us as musicians, it's just a wonderful joy to approach a new, uh, new uh, session with the violin or vocal because something new is going to come up. Can we translate it into words? Perhaps I have tried that with limited success. Let me just say. Wonderful. But you know, actually, uh, there, there was something which you said, which I could relate to because several of my books mm -hmm. uh, where I was writing uh, ancient pa parts of my narrative uh, running 2000 years ago and 3000 years ago, recently, of course, uh, the great maestro uh, Pandit Jasraj passed away. Yes. And in fact, uh, uh, in the mornings, early morning hours at five o'clock and six o'clock, I would be listening to Haveli Sangeet, 
Mm. while writing those particular narratives. Uh, and it was quite incredible, the sort of flow of words that would happen when one simply put on the, the you know, the, precisely, precisely. the AirPods and, uh, you know, had, had that particular music flowing at that early morning hour. So uh, I can fully understand where you are coming from. Uh, let me let me go to Yoganand Shastri ji. Uh, 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 Yoganand Shastri ji, you are not only interested in uh, Agam, in Tantra, in Indian culture, uh, in spoken Sanskrit, but surprisingly, you are also very very versatile in the technical field. Uh, I mean. Uh, uh, electronics, hardware design, product development, and so many other things. So I wanted to ask you this question. Ki, you know, log kehte hai ki Sanskrit ka upyog vigyan ki dunya mein kiya ja sakta hai. They say that it's a very, very scientific language. Uh, yes. And that, uh, that, that, that in comparison to many, many other languages, science, uh, Sanskrit tends to be more scientific. So could you enlighten all of us here in terms of what makes Sanskrit scientific? Sanskrit ki jo rachna hai, yakran ki rachna hamare ek hamare mind ko kafi effect karta hai, hamare flexibility badha raha hai. Dusri baat jo dhwani hai, yahan dhwani ko log kam dhyan dete hai, lekin jo dhwani Sanskrit ki jo dhwani hai, naad hai, jo Sanskrit bolte samay nikalta hai, iski मन शांत हो जाता है आपको क्या बताएं मैं हर चीज हर फील्ड में कोशिश कर रहा हूं कुछ ना कुछ जानने का और जब तक मैं संस्कृत नहीं जानता था मैं पहले कोई लैंग्वेज सीख नहीं सकता था कोई भी मेरी दादी जी हमको फ्रेंच सिखाना आती थी कुछ भी समझने नहीं आता था फिर जब संस्कृत सीखा इसके बाद मैंने हिंदी सीखी इसके बाद और भी भाषा सीखी लेकिन संस्कृत वो एक प्रकार से आपके एक मन को ओपन कर देता है आपकी मन की ए, क्या कर सकते हैं जो बाधाएं हैं भाषा को समझने की उसको क्लीन करता है साफ करता है और फिर आप कोई भी भाषा सिर्फ भाषा नहीं आपकी अलग विषयों में जो तर्किक शक्ति भी साथ में आ जाती है संस्कृत भाषा और तर्क शास्त्र और संस्कृत के विषयों को पढ़ने के बाद जो तर्किक शक्ति है वह आपकी उसकी वृद्धि हो जाती है पर पर अगर आप आज के कई आर्टिकल्स ऐसे आ रहे हैं जो कह रहे हैं कि भाई आ, जो जो जैसे संस्कृत का ग्रामर है जो संस्कृत का जो बाइनरी है जो आ, जैसे हम हमारे जो मंत्र के उच्चारण हैं उनमें भी जो पैटर्न्स हैं वो आ, किसी प्रकार का उसका कोरिलेशन कर रहे हैं साइंस के साथ तो इस इसमें आपको क्या लगता है कि इसमें एक्चुअली कुछ आ, जिसे कहते हैं इसमें कुछ ये जो तर्क है इसमें कुछ वजन है कि लोग कोशिश करते हैं कि साइंस से किसी चीज को प्रूफ करना है जो स्वतः प्रूफ है अब साइंस जो आजकल हम लोग पाश्चात्य साइंस देखते हैं वो अभी उस तर्क तक जो सामान्य की बात कर रहा हूं हो सकता है वैज्ञानिक कहीं लैब में बहुत आगे पहुंच गए लेकिन जो सामान्य हम लोग के नॉलेज में है वो तो अभी बच्चा है वो भारतीय संस्कृति और भारतीय ज्ञान विज्ञान के सामने बहुत पीछे हैं आप अभिनवगुप्त जी के सिद्धांत शब्द के ऊपर जो उन्होंने लिखा है जो उन्होंने विचार किया है वो अभी पाश्चात्य वैज्ञानिक उसमें प्रवेश करना शुरू कर रहे हैं तो वो लोग साबित तो नहीं कर सकते हैं वो लोग अभी शिष्य हैं तो ये विज्ञान से साबित करना भी यहाँ एक प्रश्न खड़ा होता है कि विज्ञान साबित करता है पचास साल बाद उसको दूसरे से दंड काट देते हैं और और आगे हम लोग जाते हैं क्योंकि विज्ञान का रास्ता हमेशा आगे आगे हमको ले जाता है हम लोग आगे आगे बढ़ रहे हैं हमेशा तो यहाँ साबित करने का शब्द थोड़ा अपने जगह पर ठीक नहीं है विज्ञान बता सकते हैं कि हाँ इसमें कुछ है फिलहाल का विज्ञान हाँ इसमें कुछ तथ्य है तथ्य है ओके लेट मी कम टू एंडी फ्रेंक and uh, you know uh, you have spoken about uh, you know brahma being inspired by one word at the dawn of creation uh, you you know the word that krishna spoke to surya or uh, prelad hearing 
uh, in the womb of his mother, the words of Narad Muni. Uh, you, you know, uh, not touched upon it, but uh, you know, it, I mean, we we've seen the power of the words even emerging from Abhimanyu's understanding of the chakra view while inside the womb of his mother. So, could you please, for uh, you know, for for a Western audience, uh, uh, does this does this part of it uh, uh, strike you as something which is an extremely powerful theme that just the frequency, just the vibration of the word uh, uh, could have so much meaning, so much importance? Um, before I answer, I must uh, thank you for, uh, and the way you're conducting uh, this panel session, it's very interactive. I really appreciate that. And thank I you. appreciate the uh, thoughts of uh, the other panelists. Thank you so very much. Although you're, you're speaking in Sanskrit, I think, or uh, Hindi. Well, Yoganam Shast Shastriji is speaking in Hindi, and I think uh, he had he had message saying that he prefers to actually express himself uh, in Hindi. So, okay, but, but we are going to try and but we Andy, we are going to try and mix it up between Hindi and English so that we can make sure that everyone remains involved. Fantastic. No, that's fantastic. I really appreciate that. The diversity is very interesting. But uh, getting back to your uh, question. Actually, when I met Srila Prabhupada, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada, the founder of the Hare Krishna movement here in the West, uh, he gave me an understanding that actually uh, words are very powerful. Wor words can both elevate the consciousness and also degrade the consciousness. And so it depends how you use the, uh, the words. The words can be used as a weapon. The words can be used to heal. Uh, so the words are, and stories, I like to talk about stories because, uh, you know, words by themselves don't really mean anything Absolutely. until you put them together and create. Absolutely. And you're a writer, of course. Absolutely. And so uh, uh, the, the words together in, in a collective sense, then they have uh, much more power. And of course, uh, in the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna also in the 10th chapter of Bhagavad Gita, Krishna mentions how powerful even one word can be. He, he focuses on the word Om. And he also focuses uh, in that uh, section, he also talks about the power of the Japa. The, yes. Uh, chanting, meditating. So that vibration, actually, uh, there's a power in the vibration itself. The vibration, like I said, could be elevating. Or Krishna also explains in the Bhagavad Gita that there are three modes. You are familiar okay. with these three modes. The lower mode is tamas, and then there's raja, and sattva, sattva guna. So the sattva guna is goodness, the raja guna is passion, and the tamaguna is ignorance. Mm -hmm. So there's activities, there's sound vibration that correlate with these three different modes. But the trick actually for the aspiring spiritualist is to latch on even to not only goodness is fine, Goodness is where we want to get to as a society. Right. But for the aspiring spiritualist, then one can even go uh, up to the transcendent level through words, the uh, Sudha Sattva. So this is the, um, w what we really want to connect with, whether it's through a mantra, whether it's through uh, sacred stories, so more and more, we want to um, put ourselves in connection with that higher vibration, the higher words. So it's a science that Krishna explains in the Bhagavad Gita. And do you, do you believe that, uh, that, that in today's time and today's age, I mean, I, I uh, know uh, the little bit that I know uh, is that for the longest time, most of our sacred texts in India 
were not uh, were not written, but they were orally transmitted. Uh, now, do you think that there there was a reason why that oral transmission was preferred, or do you think it's simply because we didn't have a writing system? No, it was a preferable because you have to be very attentive. You can't go back. Now we have retrieval systems. The first retrieval system was when uh, this was documented in the form of writing. Now we have computers, so many different gadgets where we can reach. If we don't understand a particular point that the speaker is making, then we can go back and reread the page. Or we can go back and re-reference the video. Right. But in those days, in the previous ages, people's mentalities were much keener. And they didn't need any retrieval systems. But 5,000 years ago, Veda Vyas, he understood what was coming, this Kali Yuga. And the Kali Yuga, the consciousness is degraded, unfortunately, in this dark age of Kali Yuga. It's an age of confusion, an age of argumentation, an age of hypocrisy, an age of anger. So these are the heavier modes pressing down upon the consciousness. And so he gave people a, a kind of a lifeline. Here, if you take the books and by reading the books, then it's, it, 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 it almost has the same potency as the oral transmission. Of course, you still need a spiritual guide. You still need a guru. Actually, when uh, <clears throat> at the beginning of, of the, uh, the Namaste 2020, yes. uh, Hari Kiran was speaking about, they have a, uh, his organization, I think it's called uh, Indic uh, Ac Academia. Uh, his organization has a banyan tree. And so he was saying that he envisions that there's the guru sitting under, under the banyan tree disseminating this knowledge. So Krishna explains in the fourth chapter of the Bhagavad Gita that I originally spoke this knowledge to Vivashvan, the sun god, millions and millions of years ago. Mm. And Vivashvan spoke it to Manu. Manu is the father of mankind. Mm. And Manu gave it to Ikshvaku. And Ikshvaku disseminated it to the kings of the ancient earth. And so now this knowledge is coming down and what is called the Parampara system. Parampara is the disciplic succession from teacher to student. And, from, uh, and they become mature, they become teachers, and it's going down from one generation to another. And so unfortunately now we also, beside the teacher, we also need the written word and the retrieval systems, all of the retrieval systems that we have on the internet. Wonderful. You, you made that sound very, very simple. Uh, so, so, so thank you for that. Um, let, let, let me get to uh, Vasudev. And uh, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Vasudev, but besides being, of course, a, a musician, I think the other, uh, the other thing that really distinguishes you uh, is a love for animals and a love for animal welfare. And uh, of course, uh, you know, in, in recent times, uh, uh, people have been going back to our ancient texts and have been talking about the fact that it's when we talk about love for humanity, it's, it is love for all living creatures, for all creatures. Uh, so could you enlighten us a little bit about, uh, you know, the sort of words uh, that have, in, have been uh, penned by our seers in order to inculcate that sort of behavior? Certainly, Dan, this is a subject that's, uh, I mean, I would say very, very close to my heart. Um, and um, I go back to my own uh, childhood and I would say that, uh, you know, I, I think my family was, 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 was compassionate, but not any more or any less than any other. We didn't know, we were just ignorant of the extraordinary amount of pain and suffering our daily actions cause on animals because we just have have been programmed to think that we are superior so that is uh, you know that is something which i don't know which we will be able to take care of but going back to this point the wonderful thing about our country 
is that somehow we are able to coexist in a kind of a casual way with dogs, cats, cattle, etc., etc., and we give them with various varying degrees of uh, of uh, you know success some amount of respect. You know, for example, you might even go to a little place down, uh, uh, you know, a small neighborhood. There'll be a cow that's going back. Someone will will go and touch its its, its behind and and you know pray to it and so on. So there is this whole. Uh, culture of respect for animals has come down and that's something to be very very proud of that's of course to some extent going away you know but uh, going back to your, your question of course so much has been written but in particular i want to talk about the jaina scriptures okay mm -hmm. and i think the jains have done an unbelievable amount of analysis into this whole question of how how we claim to be superior and what is the extent that we should uh, try to avoid harm i mean the, 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 so talking about birds, right? I mean, I'll just take a minute to read something. Again, this is a translation. What do we do? So the first truth of Jainism, just look at the beautiful, beautiful words, simple, beautiful words. Non-injury to all living beings is the only religion. Okay, they say that, okay? All breathing, existing, living, sentient creatures should not be slain, nor treated with violence, nor abused, nor tormented, nor driven away. This is the pure, unchangeable law. Therefore, cease to injure living, living things. So in this line, you can continue and you see the sutras in, in the Jaina, Jaina works to be of unbelievable. It's very moving. It's just moving that someone has thought about it to the extent that they have thought to. The lim it's like limitless compassion in the words that they have used. You know, it's something I, I wouldn't even have thought of these kinds of things. Every, in, every sentient being has feelings, no matter how ugly or how small. So this kind of stuff in the words that, you know, this, the Anna script, and of course, so many, so many more, right? there's no point, uh, you know, uh, talking about all that, but certainly our, we have to be very proud of the fact that our, 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 our ancestors, our, our, our religious heritage, all of them in beautiful words, ask us, of course, cow, cows, you know, ask us to worship the mother cow, ask us to worship. If you go to Karnataka, the, the, the Dattatya temple in North Karnataka, dogs, Feature. They are, they are, you know, we respect them and there's of course a whole bunch of stuff about that. Dogs, cats, rats. So everywhere somehow our scriptures have given them some kind of equivalence as far as, you know, the, uh, being able to feed. Perhaps in fact, they're even more pure. My, my theory to some extent, and you may argue with me about this, is what we take a lifetime to think about, in, you know, don't be materialistic, don't, don't harm anybody, don't do this, don't do that. All the beautiful thoughts are already being practiced by, by animals to some extent, you know, and this particular point has also been thought about by so many. If you look at the Mahabharata last, uh, of course you're obviously familiar with that, that the, the last, uh, the, the, the scene in which the five brothers and um, the, you know, the wife, they go out to, to heaven, followed by a dog, right? If you remember that particular story, you, you just, uh, and they say, he asked, who, who will enter the chariot to go to heaven? He says the dog must go and then, you know, Indra refuses and so on. So I'm just saying that there has been so much written about animal welfare in our scriptures. I'm, I'm frankly unsure that any other civilization has given so much merit. But I, I, I say that with a caveat because I honestly don't know. Perhaps they have. But I can say that, uh, you know, the Jainas, the Buddhist scriptures, of course, the Hindu scriptures have all gone deep into this aspect. Now, this is important because in today's day and age, if you look at even COVID and all this business, there is something to do with the fact of complete disrespect for the animal world. Uh, which is it's probably a payback time, you know, which, which is coming forward. In fact, let me, let me share one little uh, thing with you. My very first book uh, was actually about animal rights. It was a dystopian novel in which I said that, you know, the universe had come to a conclusion that the only thing which was a catastrophe in, on, in this existence was the human soul, and it needed to be wiped out because you know, animals were much pure. It's, it's a secondary matter that was never published. But I'm saying I've been obsessed by this thought for a very long time that somehow, uh, you know, we have, we have a culture, we have uh, scriptures that speak so highly about the need to be compassionate. But in fine practice, we're not, not doing very much. But there is hope, Ashwin, there is hope. Uh, just the other day, you, I met somebody who spoke about having, you know, turned, turned the corner in terms of how they are looking at animals. And again, they were falling back upon something they had read in, in some, some scriptural thing. So I'm just saying, and that, as far as the soft power of Indian writing is concerned, Again, that's something we can project to the world very, very well. Uh, again, veganism is becoming popular. Animal welfare is becoming popular. And there's a lot of stuff that we can therefore project from our uh, traditions and, 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 and ancient writing. That's what I want to say. Wonderful. That's beautiful. Uh, 
you, you know, I, I, I want to now uh, go to uh, go back to uh, Yoganand Shastri ji. Uh, and uh, uh, Yoganand Shastri ji, I am the father of my father, my father is from Jodhpur, and my mother is from Kanpur. So, this is the mission of Rajasthan and Uttar Pradesh. का मेरे रगों में है तो मेरे जो नाना जी थे वो कानपुर के रहने वाले थे और वो कई कहानियां बताते थे और कई ऐसी कहानियां बताते थे कि भाई हम गंगा जी के तट गए थे और वहाँ पर एक हम साधु से मिले वो जो साधु थे उन्होंने कहा बेटा जरा अपनी आंखें बंद करो तो हमने अपनी आंखें बंद कर दी और फिर करीब एक या दो मिनट बाद उन्होंने कहा आंखें खोल लो तो जब हमने आंखें खोली तो वो नहीं थे साधु जो थे वो साधु महाराज वो वहां पर थे नहीं तो हमने आए दाए बाए पीछे आगे सब देखा पर नहीं वो दिख दिख नहीं रहे थे फिर ऊपर से आप एक आवाज आई मूर्ख ऊपर देख और फिर हमने ऊपर देखा तो वो ऊपर फ्लोट कर रहे थे लेविटेशन तो उस वक्त जब नाना जी ये कहानियां बताते थे तो कई बार मुझे लगता था कि नाना जी क्या पी रहे हैं ये कुछ चर, चरसी हैं या क्या हैं कि मतलब ऐसी कहानियां कहाँ से आती हैं इनके जहन में पर आज जब मैं खुद लेखक बन गया हूं और जब मैं खुद अपने आ, कहानियों को नरेट करता हूं तो मुझे लगता है कि यू नो देर इज इन इन इंग्लिश दिस प्रोवर्ब इट सेज दैट एबसेंस ऑफ एविडेंस इज नॉट एविडेंस ऑफ एबसेंस आई बिगन टू अंडरस्टैंड दिस दैट क्यू that just because i do not understand something doesn't make it less real to wo ek ek jisse kehte hain ek purana sher tha nazar ko badlo to nazare badal jate hain soch ko badlo to sitare badal jate hain to isme main aap se puchna chahta hu that to what extent do words influence our reality in a, uh, so in is it is it that uh, simply you know uh, we think that oh this is the real world but our emotions our thoughts our words our communication doesn't this actually create our reality we can see by our shabdon ko shabdon ke through hum log dekh rahe hain na hum logon ko hum log vastavikta dekh nahi pate hain bas ye ye kehne ka matlab hai na bilkul बचपन से हम लोगों को बताया जाता है सिखाया जाता है कि वे ऑफ थिंकिंग हाउ वी कैन वी हैव टू थिंक ये हमको सिखाया जाता है कैसे दुनिया को देखना तो ये हमारी दृष्टि को बंद कर देता है अवरोध कर देता है आप विदेश जाके देख सकते हैं वहां के लोग अलग चीज देखते हैं आप अलग चीज देख रहे हैं आपके संस्कारों में कुछ और चीज पकड़ने की क्षमता है पर उन लोगों में ये क्षमता नहीं है या उल्टा वो लोग कुछ पकड़ रहे हैं आप नहीं पकड़ रहे हैं सही बात है हम लोग हमेशा बचपन से यदि शिक्षा सही तरीके से नहीं हो तो हम लोगों का मन और अशिक्षित हो जाता है और हम लोगों का मन को बंद किया जाता है हम वास्तविकता नहीं देखते हम सिर्फ शब्दों के अर्थों को देखते हैं और शब्दों को जब हम लोग किसी चीज का नाम रख दिया है हम लोगों को लगता है कि हम इस चीज को जान लिए हमको बताया जाता है ये चीज है ये किताब है ठीक है किताब है वास्तव में किताब क्या है हमको तो नहीं पता उस समय सोचते नहीं हम लोग एक शब्द को लेके अपने ज्ञान को सीमित कर देते हैं बिल्कुल हमको लगता है कि हमारा ज्ञान हो गया है वो खासकर इस विषयों में देखने को मिलता है जब हम किसी आदमी के बारे में बोलना चाहते हैं ये तो लेखक है हमारे नजर में आ जाता है लेखक कैसा होता है बस खत्म हम सीमित कर दिए उस व्यक्ति उसे पूरे व्यक्ति तो हम नहीं देख रहे हम लेखक को देख रहे हैं हम संगीत वाले को देख रहे हैं हमारी हमारा दृष्टि हमारी दृष्टि सीमित हो जाती है तो ये तो ये बात तो है शब्द शब्द हमको सीमित भी कर देता है जैसे आप शिव जैसा शिव शिव सूत्रों में ज्ञानम बंधा ज्ञान भी हमको सीमित कर देते हैं ज्ञानम बंधा ये शिव सूत्र का सूत्र है जो ये ज्ञान हम हमको सीमित कर देता है क्योंकि हमको लगता है हम जान लिए जबकि हम सिर्फ शब्दों को 
बिल्कुल ना जो हमारा इस किसी शब्द का मीनिंग हमको अर्थ मालूम था उसी को सिर्फ लगा दिए बिल्कुल और हम जाने नहीं बिल्कुल आपने बहुत बड़ी बात कह दी थैंक यू सो मच लेट मी गो टू एंडी फ्रेंकल एंड एंडी आई वॉन्ट टू आस्क यू यू नो इट्स इट इट इज ऑफन सेट दैट फिलोसफी इज क्वेश्चन दैट मे नेवर बी आंसर्ड एंड ऑन दी अदर हैंड रिलीजन is answers that may never be questioned uh, and you know th- this is something which which sort of strikes me we are we are living in a world where uh, we are living in a world of extremities and there is a lot of polarization and we are seeing also a, a certain rise of fundamentalism happening around the world so in particular could you possibly uh, for a minute dwell on what you consider to be and as as someone who is not just a writer and a storyteller but someone who has also studied a lot of the dharmic texts could you possibly enlighten us on the divergence between the dharmic and the abrahamic traditions in some ways uh, well you know, one thing i wanted to mention because at the beginning of the discussion you were concerned about the time yeah. but you know don't worry about the time because i'm the one that's doing the next program <laughs> The next program is my, my kata will be specifically Absolutely. about Mahabharat. <laughs> Absolutely. And so we, you know, um, uh, if, if uh, I may, if I may inter- interject for a minute, I know that you have a session starting at eight thirty, so uh, we we will wrap up well before then. But uh, you, you know, I, I I just wanted to sort of get your insight into this because one of the books that I had written when I had just started out as a writer. i found uh-huh. it very interesting that uh, you know when when i looked at the words like for example abraham and then i looked at the word brahma and mm-hmm. uh, or for example abraham's wife being sara but uh, brahma's consort being saraswati <laughs> now you know for, for me these were these were uh, points where you know i i'm a thriller writer so i always look for these curiosities in order mm-hmm. to explore them but uh, i wanted you to uh, sort of spend a couple of minutes and talk about this dharmic versus abrahamic uh uh setup and the ideologies are they that different i, I don't no they're not different at all once you get to the essential understanding but one thing i wanted to mention i'm not a great uh, scholar but uh, i'd like to share more about my experience because uh, when i met shrila prabhupad Sure. I thought here is a genuine sadhu and uh, you know in in my experience with the abrahamic traditions people are saying we're right and everyone who doesn't anyone who doesn't agree with us they're going to hell this is uh, kind of the, the what you mentioned the fundamental the right. fundamental element Right. of course there's that fundamental element in all religions absolutely and even now it's seeping into our politics as well right. you know there's the uh, that fundamentalist that oh this is right and anything else is wrong so they there can never be any compromise on a political form or there never can be any discussion on a spiritual or religious form that We, these um these different traditions don't invalidate one another but they're meant to enlighten one another and so when i met shrila prabhupad uh, a reporter had asked him why have you come to america and mm-hmm. prabhupad said i've come to make christians better christians and jews better jews and hindus better hindus so f- for the the uh, vedic tradition the hindu tradition a real hindu sees all others as also valid Absolutely. that they're, they're not going to hell and uh, so prabhupad he understood this perfectly and he wanted to enlighten others he didn't want to transform them or change them or convert anyone no he wanted simply to give that enlightenment of the bhagavad gita and of the vedic paradigm and so right. uh, one of the if i may uh, if i have an uh, another uh, can course, i please 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 know, carry on 
I don't know if, uh, if it was yourself. Someone was mentioning mythology uh, earlier in the discussion. And so, of course, from the Vaishnava perspective, from Prabhupada's perspective, the Vedic tradition is, is not mythology. Actually, the Vedic tradition is itihasa. Itihasa, of course, means that which happened. That's right. And uh, so, so we, the, the sadhus and the Vedantists, they have a, a different paradigm. Of course, you can consider the, uh, the Mahabharat, you know, this is on one level, it's itihasa. On another level, it could be beautiful stories and poems. That's all right. And on a, on a third level, it also focuses on practical uh, application on how the Dharma is being applied. Because mm -hmm. the four original Vedas, they talk about all of these things. The Dharma, they talk about the different rituals. But here, when the Mahabharata is introduced, then the stories, the, the Dharma is introduced through stories. So the stories are like a, vest, a container, a chalice that is holding the liquid. And so uh, the, the stories, not only are they itihasa, but they're containing the wonderful philosophy of right. the Vedic knowledge. Perfect. That's so beautifully expressed. Uh, I think it was uh, C.S. Lewis who said that a myth is a lie that reveals a truth. So <laughs> I, I don't think we were looking for an absolute factual statement. What we were looking for was to dig deeper down into in into what was the deeper truth of that story. Uh, and frankly, Andy, my own perspective as, as a person who, who writes a lot, of, uh, a lot of commercial books within this space, I have always believed that to a very great extent, there is an overlap between Itihasa and Purana. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, because you have so many elements. I mean, if you consider, let's say, the Ramayana and the Mahabharata, uh, then that is what we identified as Itihasa in this country. And on the other hand, we had all the Puranas, which were meant to be more fantastical accounts. <laughs> but then within the Itehasas, within the epics, we have also stories which are very, very fantastic and difficult to believe. And on the other hand, we have within the Puranas, we have lineages of actual kings who lived through that mm -hmm. time. So in that sense, I believe that there is a strong overlap. And I think that is what you are alluding to. I, yeah, uh, I appreciate that. But on, yeah. on one note, um, <clears throat> What, you know, uh, the word myth is used in different ways. Sure. And what I'm, uh, what I, my preference is like uh, the way Joseph Campbell used the word myth. Okay. He understood myth in the classical sense that mythology and the myth of the stories of a culture, they define what that culture is about. The, right. the, those are the important stories. They give the, the uh, people an understanding of a sense of being, a sense of belonging, and also who, who the good guys are, who the bad guys are, the definition of all of the, the sacred uh, things in the life of that culture. Oh, abs so absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, I, I couldn't agree more. Let, let, me, let me take this very line of discussion forward with Vasudev. Uh, you, you know, uh, Vasudev, there was a very interesting if, uh, uh, event that happened in my life. I had gone to Kolkata in order to deliver a lecture. And I had a little time at, on hand, uh, you know, which was free in the afternoon. So I told my driver, I said, take me to some interesting place. And he said, well, uh, you know, would you like to go to a temple? Now, if you're in Kolkata and the driver says, I'm taking you to a temple, you... 99% chances are that it's a Durga temple or a Kali temple <laughs> or something. Yeah, sure. uh, but uh, we went to this temple and it didn't look like a temple from outside. Very, very ordinary structure. And I walked in, it had whitewashed walls, must have not been more than about maybe, uh, maybe around 15 feet by 15 feet. In the center, there was a green colored throne. And uh, there was a pujari who was performing his puja and aarti and everything. There were people worshipping. And when I looked closer, Vasudev, I found that on the throne, there was a portrait of Amitabh Bachchan. 
the the Bollywood superstar Amitabh sure, Bachchan sure, sure. was on that. Uh, his his picture was on that throne, and in front of that were were a pair of shoes that had been used for the shooting of a movie called Kuli. Uh, so those were also lying there, and I pinched myself. I, I I said, "Have I entered into some parallel dimension, some parallel <laughs> universe? What is going on?" So I walked out of the temple, and I was waiting for my car. And a little boy was selling uh, agarbattis and prashad and uh, you know uh, prayer books. I bought exactly one item from him. It was a little prayer book which was known as the Amitab Chalisa, uh, and uh, that's the moment I realized that no, no, this is for real. This is I've actually arrived at an Amitab temple. Now the question I asked myself at that moment was that imagine Ashwin, if your car comes hurtling towards you at a high speed and you get knocked down at this moment, and uh, you die on the spot. and now you are you take rebirth as per the law of karma 1000 years from now and a thousand years from now the cult of amitab worship has really caught on now there isn't one temple dedicated to amitab but Many. there are a thousand temples or a lakh uh, <laughs> and someone was to ask you that do you think that amitab could have been a real man uh, and the the question that we are asking ourselves today about people like ram and krishna are precisely that same question that could these have been real could these have been historical characters so i was just wondering that do you have a take on this do you think that uh, that what is contained in what we like to call our myths uh, could could they contain kernels of truth okay um, the short answer is most likely they have now whether these are concoctions or whether in fact as the exactly the same thing that these are just inventions these stories are inventions it's fine because i suppose we uh, we appreciate myth we like stories and that's probably why you know for example the story i'm going to ask you a question on this in fact the readers want to go into a different dimension imagine a world of perfection beauty where good prevails over evil and all these kinds of things oh. uh, you know so so it it, it 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 i mean i can't do it out because you know i was not there we have been but is it is it indoctrination is it brainwashing Uh, but at the same time, if there are certain good qualities that are being transmitted as a result of these these stories, is that does that excuse it? I suppose it's okay, uh, Ashwin, because you know if, if the purpose of storytelling, as a, as a, as a Andy was he was mentioning talking about storytelling, you know the the story contains the word and transmits certain knowledge. I think approximate words like that. I'm okay with it, frankly. You know, if if a thousand years from now I find uh, if I'm reborn and I see an Amitabh temple and if there were certain good qualities that somehow he would. he has been come come down with amitab chalisa as long as the principle something good be compassionate be kind tell the truth all those kinds of things are coming across it's fine with me so i can't answer that because it's it's a, it's a loaded question also you know i mean what do i say i, I can't prove it either. i can't prove <laughs> I it wanted, i wanted to put you on the spot <laughs> yeah, so dev i you, i i'm glad i achieved what i wanted to do i which, wanted which, to which, put which, you which on is the fine but because but, but also you realize one thing so let's 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 for the sake of argument uh, you know and in fact you see i have a a little uh, you know a thing over shop uh, just on that right <laughs> so the, the thing is these myths whether they are true or false from a musical perspective i'll just take music for the, for a moment uh, you must realize the so called myth and i i take use that word carefully of rama okay mm -hmm. has given rise to an extraordinary amount of powerful music the composers like tyagaraja and so on and there is krishna you know there's a whole krishna cult. so those those things have somehow inspired creativity and created you know you have tulsi das here your tyagaraj are there so it's good these things have have created a whole bunch of beautiful thoughts beautiful expressions emotions they have influenced people directed them in different directions they have taken people towards war we have one over evil you know it's created a beautiful thing so i don't actually mind i don't think anything bad has happened if if indeed what you're saying is true i mean you didn't say it's true but if we if we if we even fact even consider the possibility which incidentally i want to say our culture allows us to take every single thought and question it which is fine so your point is is fine we we'll take it take it as it is let's suppose that was actually the case i'm okay with it because it has given rise to so many beautiful things whether it's architecture whether it's songs whether it's scriptures uh, you know sanskrit whatever i'm i'm fine with that again is the power of words has taken has perhaps distorted in a very beautiful way certain kernels of truth that were there and created these beautiful layers and and made them presentable to us that's sure. fine sure 
No, I, 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 I would, I would, I like the word layers that you use because, I mean, if you consider an epic like the Ramayan, uh, of course, the the starting point, of course, is the Valmiki Ramayan, which then goes on to the so-called Tulsi Ramayan, and then you have two hundred and ninety-eight other versions, three hundred versions oh. of the Ramayan. Uh, and I find it difficult to believe that those 300 versions, even though each of them tends to narrate a slightly different story. Yeah, because yeah. if you look at, let's say, something like hypothetically the Adbhut Ramayana, you have uh, an allusion to the fact that maybe Sita could be Ravan's daughter. Or uh, yeah. uh, the Anand Ramayana, you, you have allusions to the fact that uh, the, the person who actually killed uh, Ravan was uh, Sita manifesting as Durga. The Jain Ramayana, it is Lakshman who kills uh, uh, Ravan, you know, I mean, uh, uh, you have a Muslim Ramayana in which Ram is a Sultan, you have a, you know, so you have multiple versions of that same epic. And, 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 the, and you have to mention the, the Southeast Asia, the Eastern Asia versions Absolutely. of Cambodia, Thailand. The Lao Ramayana, the yeah. Lao Ramayana and yeah. so many yeah. others. So who, and, whose and, version is true, you know. Exactly, okay. and that, I think that is what was great about uh, uh, about this, the, 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 the culture that we came up from was that your truth does not negate mine. Sure, that fair we, enough, Our truth can coexist. Coexist. And, and I think we're accepting of it. And that is a great place. I'm, I'm, I'm perfectly fine with patting ourselves on the back. Our, our, our system allows us to consider various possibilities with equal respect. There's no okay. problem. You go, you go to Cambodia and hear a different version of Rama and something else happened. Garuda came there, went away. Ram, Ram went here. It sounds strange, but it's fine. If you, you think that way, that's perfectly fine. So, yeah. point point okay. taken. But I, I, before you move on to the next the next oh. uh, thing, I, I just want to make a point. Uh, I want to ask you because you know you've been extremely uh, courteous and helpful in, in passing on. I think it's only fair I should ask you something similar. You write, okay. and uh, uh, you also I would say I'm taking the uh, liberty of saying you perhaps use creative liberties, which is important, right? You yeah. take what he was talking about uh, itihasa and then the puranas and and create your own perhaps stories. Now, why do you do that? Is it, is it when you look at it from a reader's perspective, Ashwin, um, hmm. uh, is it, are you sometimes thinking of it, is, does, the, does the reader wish to be confronted with certain uncomfortable new truths or uh, what are you trying to do to the reader? I mean, what, what is your uh, motivation? I, I have a very simple formula really, Vasudev. My formula is that I take two words. The first word is a word called myth. And the second is a word called history. Mm. And I put them into a particle collider at CERN. Okay. And I send these two particles mm. charging towards one another at a very high speed mm. so that they fuse together into a completely new independent particle. Okay. And the equation is myth plus history equal to mystery. I because see. Interesting. Where, where, you can, where you can find those gray areas, the overlap, mm. that is mm. what makes for that very delicious question, which mm. is called what if. What, what if? if the Mahabharat was a real event? Okay. What if Krishna was a historical character? Mm -hmm. uh, and so those are the sort of questions which lend themselves to that, uh, that, that space of being able to anticipate. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, there are those who say that, hey, listen, you know, after all, myth is a fantasy and history is factual. But I am one of those who always has believed in the uh, in, in you know, in, it was George Santana who said that history is a pack of lies about mm. events that never happened, written by people who were never there. Oh, so in that sense, in that sense, history uh, is just a version of events. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, to to that extent, what I at least like, for example, I've written a, a novel which is relatively famous called Chanakya Stunt. Mm. The entire story that we have about Chanakya. Uh, mm -hmm. comes to us from a, actually a Sanskrit play known as Mudra Rakshas, mm -hmm. which was written almost 700 years after the passing away of Kautilya, mm -hmm. which, which now we treat de facto as our history. Yeah, yeah, so, sure. To a very great extent, the way I see it is that I try and do mm -hmm. a lot of research in order to create a superstructure, columns, beams, mm -hmm. and then the gaps which are there, I fill them with my bricks and my cement and my, mm -hmm. my uh, plaster, mm -hmm. uh, and that is the fiction. So the superstructure, which is in terms of history uh, or theology or mythology is already there. It's already constructed in some ways. Wonderful. And that's pretty much what I do. Fantastic. fantastic. And, and uh, to, to the to other gentleman who spoke about Sanskrit, you know, the Sanskrit, again, uh, I, I just want to tie up these loose ends because these are, these are very interesting points you're making. Again, Sanskrit plays, Sanskrit in our music. Those are powerful, powerful, uh, you know, shall we say, 
uh, stimulants or things that enter our system and have created yes. the culture as it is now. I just want to make that remark. Perfect. Thank you. Lovely. Thanks. Uh, let me go to Yoganand Shastri ji. And uh, uh, Yoganand ji, your interest is in the Agam. And I don't know much about it, but many people say that in the Agam and Ved there is a difference in the Agam. कि इन इनमें कुछ फर्क है तो एक तो मैं चाह रहा था कि अगर आप इस पे थोड़ी टिप्पणी करें और दूसरी चीज मैं पूछना चाह रहा था कि ये जो हम कहते हैं यंत्र मंत्र और तंत्र इन तीनों में ये जो पाठ हैं अलग-अलग पथ हैं इनमें फर्क क्या है इनमें अंतर क्या है आगम आगम की परंपरा उतना है जितना वैदिक परंपरा उतना ही पुरानी मानी जाती हैं जितनी भारत की भक्ति परंपराएं हैं शैव वैष्णव शाक्त सौर और गणपत्या ये पांच आगम हैं पांच आगम हैं जितनी भी परंपराएं हैं वो सब आगमों से निकली हुई हैं जितनी भी वैष्णव पांचरत्र से निकले हैं जितनी भी भक्ति संप्रदाय हैं सब आगमों से निकले हैं इसमें वेदों के साथ विरोध या न विरोध इसमें ज्ञानियों का अलग-अलग मतभेद होता है क्योंकि दोनों रुचिनाम वाय चित्रियत रिजिकुटिला ना ना पथा जोशम नरिनाम एको गम्यस्तव मसिपयसाम आरना वाई वा तो वो अलग-अलग मर्ग होते हैं यहाँ विधि विधान पूजा साधना में तो भेद होता ही है तंत्रिक एवं वैदिक पूजा पद्� अभी यदि आप भारत को आजकल के परिवेश में देखेंगे तो वैदिक परंपरा बहुत सीमित है अभी सब आगम से निकली हुई परंपरा प्रचलित है पुराणों के के साथ मिलाके क्योंकि जितनी भी भक्ति जितनी भी आप याग्य याग देख रहे हैं कोई वैदिक योगा भी बहुत कम होता है सब पौराणिक याग होते हैं जो आगमों के आधार पर बने हैं तो परंपराएं उसमें बहुत हैं, बहुत विस्तृत कश्मीर जो शायव आगम हैं, स्पंद शास्त्र हैं, फिर प्रत्यभिज्ञा, अनेक अनेक संप्रदाय हैं, फिर श्रीविद्या संप्रदाय है, फिर पांचर अत्रवाइष्णव हैं, फिर कली के कली कोला संप्रदाय है, कोला मत है, तो सभी ना सभी सभी संप्रदाय आगमों से निकले हैं। और दूसरा पूछ रहे थे यंत्र मंत्र और तंत्र तंत्र असल में यंत्र मंत्र और देवता ही अलग अलग रूप हैं देवता के रूप हैं मंत्र रूपी और यंत्र रूपी ये देवता का रूप है मंत्र रूपी देवता का रूप एक जो हम लोग चित्र में बनाते हैं मानव सदृश है दूसरा यंत्र रूप में बनाते हैं श्री यंत्र बनाते हैं अनेक अनेक देवी देवताओं का यंत्र बनाते हैं और तीसरा उसका मंत्र रूपी हैं जो साधन के लिए जप किया जाता है तो ये तीन हैं और तंत्र वो पूरी साधना को बोलते हैं जो तंत्रिक साधना जो आगमों का जो प्रैक्टिस को बोलते हैं अभ्यास को ये तंत्रिक मार्ग ब भगवान देवी देवता के जो रूप हैं वो तंत्र मंत्र यंत्र और देवता। Wonderful, thank you योगनंद जी। Coming back to Andy, Andy, I want to ask you, you know, I mean, recently we've we are we are going through difficult times. Recently, I was seeing images coming in from Sweden about the the riots that have happened there. Uh, in terms of, uh, I think, uh, uh, probably burning of the, the Holy Quran, which led to a spurt of violence. Uh, why is it that words acquire so much power? Why, why do words have so much power uh, in our belief system uh, to the point where they can, I mean, for, for the longest time, uh, we, you know, the world fought crusades and, uh, you know, uh, for, for the longest time, uh, one had a conflict between uh, the Catholics and the Protestants, between the Sunnis and the Shias, between so many different uh, branches. Uh, all, all of it related back 
to certain things that were said uh, within the scriptures or believed by those scriptures. Uh, so what do you think makes these words so powerful? You know, this is the Kali Yuga. And that means that words very often might lead to anger or frustration, confusion, just like the other gentleman and yourself were saying that, uh, and this is, applies to previous times, that the different persons with the different uh, political or spiritual perspectives, they can talk about these things, they could share their own perspectives and not be agitated in the mind. But because the words and the, the perspectives nowadays are so surcharged with emotion that I have to be right and someone else has to be wrong. And so uh, this is the age of Kali Yuga where people are degrading into argumentation. And you're going to see more and more of this. And the things that they're arguing about, actually, it's also hypocritical because mm -hmm. they themselves might not even be following it in their own lives. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, but I'd like to, uh, I had promised to share a story. I'd like to share a story, if okay. I may. And this do. is about the boy Prahlad. This is from the uh, Bhagavad Purana. And interestingly enough, the Bhagavad Purana in the third canto, there's a chapter about the womb and how a child develops within the womb, how the head is forming and then the limbs are forming and the eyes and the nose and the mouth month after month. It's a, it's a very detailed description of how these, uh, the nails that they're forming in a certain time and uh, the eyes, the various senses. And so, you know, we accept that this scripture, the Bhagavad Purana, the Puranas are thousands of years old. But even if they were only 500 years old, this is still extraordinary information Absolutely. to be had 500 years ago, let alone thousands of years ago. And so one of the first senses is the sense of hearing. And the child is absorbing what, whatever is going on around them the child is absorbing that sound vibration. If it's an angry sound vibration, if it's a pleasant sound vibration, if it's a transcendental sound vibration, the child in the womb is absorbing those things. Wow. And so Narda Muni, he uh, understood this science. By the time the, uh, the fetus is six or seven months in development, the first so, uh, the uh, sense is the sense of hearing. And so Narda Muni is sharing this knowledge with the mother and also with the child in the womb, this transcendent knowledge of the Vedas. And uh, when, so the sound vibration is coming and flooding that child every, every single day. Wow. And when the Prahlad is born at an early age, He's a, already an enlightened personality. But the problem is that he has a father. The father is the king of the land. Absolutely. And he's a very a, a tyrant. He wants everyone to believe in him. He doesn't want anyone to believe in God or anything else. He wants everyone to acknowledge that he is the greatest. But the little boy, Prahlad, he, do, he doesn't do that. <laughs> Just as uh, Prahlad, he is meditating upon the Lord within the heart. And so uh, Prahlad tells his father at one point, and he's only five or six years old. He says, Shravanam Kirtanam Vishnu Shmaranam. So this is the basis of transcendental evolution. That Shravanam means first you hear. Yes. You hear the word, and then you also, kirtanam, you repeat the word. And then finally also you remember the word, shravanam, kirtanam, vishnu, shmarnam. This is how we get, keep in touch with that transcendental vibration and our devotion to Vishnu. This is the 
basis, the essence of the Vedic culture. That is so beautiful. Thank you know, uh, honestly, this discussion, I wish we didn't have one and a half hours for this session. I wish we had three hours for this session and even that would be short. Uh, but uh, I'm, what I'm gonna do is before I request uh, Vijay Lakshmi ji to come in, uh, I'm gonna request since we are, we are approaching the, the 8.30 mark, I thought that we can just do a quick round of all the participants in order to uh, get closing remarks, but more particularly the difficult times that we are living in, the times of uh, almost, uh, you could say prelay of some sort, uh, what was talked in our scriptures as prelay or plague, uh, COVID and all of the, you know, the uh, everyone behind locked doors. Uh, are there words in your thoughts that could help in these times? So I would like to do a quick run through of all the three panelists in order to just get a few remarks from them related to this. So would you like to kick it off, Vasudev? Certainly. So Ashwin, I, uh, yes, of course, by, by its nature, it would appear that, you know, it's a, it's a bleak time full of frustration, etc. But actually, I actually see it also as a very interesting positive time, because this has forced us to reflect on uh, what is it that we really need? What is the minimum required to actually have a happy life or, or whatever that implies? So now uh, I'm seeing at my own level, certainly a lot of people looking inward and getting in touch with themselves in various ways, whether it's about music or whether it's some other passion that they had neglected for a while, mm -hmm. or whether it's some kind of a spiritual pursuit. Suddenly they have all the time in the world that's available. Suddenly there's a sense that, you know, what is really required? Do you really need all this stuff? Can we downgrade our life? Can we move downwards and live in a minimal satisfactory way? Of course, accompanied with that, I'm certain, I'm sure there's going to be a lot of other issues, psychological issues. Agree, but I would on the on the positive side. I think there has been a coming together of people um, because with a common sense of uh, of you know what the heck, what are we doing now? What can we do? So there is that. Plus, like I said, uh, all these, for example, these discussions. Uh, the, uh, I mean, this is fantastic. We are coming together as a panel. In the normal course, you'll agree with me. We're all probably meet in let's say Mumbai or some other place, and you know, uh, having a coffee together and having, but. This has forced the entire world right now on your laptop, people from all over the world. So there's a convergence of opinions, thoughts, reflection. Uh, you know, we are enjoying music more. I take a lot of time to, to, to enjoy a single note forever. Earlier, I might play a faster note on the violin. Right now, if my sa is in tune, that's perfectly okay with me. So I'm, <laughs> I'm just saying things have slowed down and I'm happy for it. That's what I wanted to say. Absolutely. That's beautiful. Thank you so much, Vasudev. And uh, let me come to Yoganand ji. Um, Yoganand Shastri ji, any last thoughts, any last words about the time that we are going through? Ye jo bahut hi sankat ki ghadi hai, uh, isme uh, aapke kuch vichar? Abhi, eh, ek bahut achcha plus point ye hai ki log Ayurved ki or vapas apni drishti dal rahe aur dekh rahe hain ki vastavik eh, उम्र अच्छे उम्र को तक जिए हैं उसके लिए क्या विज्ञान है वो बहुत अच्छा प्लस पॉइंट है बाकी तो मेरा ये कहना है कि शब्दों का अर्थ जाने और जो शब्द प्रचलित है उसके पीछे क्या कारण है क्या अर्थ है क्या मीनिंग है और क्या वास्तविकता है उसको जानने का कोशिश करें तो ज्यादा समझ में आएगा कि हो क्या रहा है बहुत बहुत Andy, some, some few thoughts, parting words in terms of the difficult times that we are going through and uh, maybe, even, maybe even an anecdote or an example or something that you feel that we should leave our audiences with. Well, personally, what's made a great difference in my life is the meditation and on the sound vibration of Hare Krishna. You know, the devotees, they're called the Hare Krishna people here in America. And so uh, I understand that, uh, you know, in this time, people are fraught with anxieties. Right. They're overwhelmed with um, a number of different uh, difficulties that are very hard even to imagine in some places in the world, that they have to contend uh, with the, these extraordinary difficulties. 
But we can't forget that Krishna spoke to Arjuna right before on the battlefield of Kurukshetra. You know, in 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 one sense, you know, this world is in is a type of a battlefield. Uh, it's a struggle, an ongoing struggle. Absolutely. Um, but, so for me, <clears throat> I, I meditate every day on the sound vibration of the holy name. I'd like to share that with you, if I may. Oh, please do. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. And so Prabhupada, he referred to this as the peace formula. Uh, how do we, you know, there's no classes that you can go to in college. How do we live peacefully? How do we live happily? Why aren't there classes like this in the college, in the universities? We all want this, but unfortunately there's no classes. And so... Yeah, no. No, no, and Andy, I'm worried about your next session, so I'm, I'm, I'm going to interrupt you right there. And I'm like gonna, I said, please take a few I'm, minutes. I'm, Don't be an anxiety. I'm, I'm going to thank you, uh, Vasudev. I'm going to thank you, Andy, and I'm going to thank you, uh, Yoganand Shastriji, uh, for having been such wonderful participants uh, in this session, and uh, thank you, Vijay Lakshmiji, for bringing us all together. Uh, uh, we are grateful to you. And I must thank you for being such a great host. Yes, I second that. I second that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm so much. <laughs> Sorry. Does someone want to say something? Thank you so much, uh, Ashwinji, for uh, tying this uh, <laughs> session in so neatly because all our panelists are so different. It would uh, require, you know, enormous skill to bring out their stories and have a, you know, one ending and not leave us with uh, many endings and many uh, plots to <laughs> dwell with. But uh, uh, I think Ashwinji, uh, you, you embody what is happening in the world today. It's a world of collaboration. No, no one nation or no one civilization or no one human being is living in isolation. We are dependent uh, and we are affected by what somebody is doing uh, millions of miles away. And I think in your work, you have collaborated with uh, James Patterson and brought out two novels, Private India and Private Delhi. And uh, we would have liked to know more about those uh, two novels. And Vasudev Murthy probably sees this kind of fusion in the world of music as uh, Indian rhythmists and Indian musicians are collaborating with uh, artists all over the world. Yeah. And uh, this uh, lockdown has made it uh, even more easier uh, for music to be made, which is uh, not uh, rooted to any one uh, region or to any one uh, system of music. That's right. That's right. You have uh, collaborations with, uh, you have rhythm, you have melody, you have harmony, everything coming beautifully together. Mm -hmm. And uh, Yoganand Shastri Ji challenges my Hindi every time I am on WhatsApp. He refuses to even uh, message in English. Uh, I must admit, uh, my Hindi has been brushed, <laughs> brushed up very well by him. And uh, in, in, in his interview with uh, CSP, uh, we asked him what is India's uh, greatest uh, contribution to the world. A very uh, staid and boring question, but the answer he gave was very interesting. He said, it's not yoga, it's not Ayurveda, it's not... Uh, necessary are text, but it is uh, this freedom uh, to pursue knowledge, which is uh, uh, allowed to any individual who uh, shows interest in our traditions and culture. I thought that was uh, so brilliantly put. Uh, he says the freedom to uh, pursue any path, to uh, study any text, to uh, do anything that you want to invest your soul energy in, you're free to do that in India. Thank you for that thought and thank you all of you for such a wonderful and invigorating discussion. Uh, thank you so much. Thank we will uh, now uh, move on to uh, our next session with uh, our co-panelist at this uh, session. Um, we, it will be, uh, he's a storyteller. We already have him uh, with us. 
So we will uh, continue. Uh, uh, Akka will just give a short introduction to the next session. Thank you.